The 12th World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference has begun in Geneva. Let's stop this meeting. I want uh, to have a word with India. And she takes out Piyush Goyal out of the room. India merely uh, nodded uh, or agreed with whatever was coming from the US and the EU. So what we have now arrived at is a proposal which is virtually unworkable. This organization, I'm convinced, does not work for the developing countries. Hello. This part of the 21st century will be remembered for the death of millions due to pandemic. This is also a time when a few pharma companies made millions and millions of dollars from the sale of COVID-related products, vaccines, medicines, and diagnoses. The whole world was trying to get hold of it, and there was shortage in many places. But nobody else could manufacture it because the pharma giants were well protected by the patent laws. So when the World Trade Organization's ministerial conference happened last month in Geneva, everybody expected relaxations in patent laws, at least for the COVID products, but nothing happened. And astonishingly, the countries which demanded such relaxation, like India, backtracked. To understand what exactly happened in Geneva, we have with us senior journalist Revika, who has been reporting WTO for the last 25 years. That is right from its inception. He is joining us from Geneva. Welcome, Radhika. I would like to start this conversation with a press statement of the Union Commerce Minister, Piyush Goyal. The statement says, India took the lead and turned the tide of negotiations from failure to enthusiasm, consensus-based outcome and optimism. Gone are the days, he says, gone are the days when India could be armed to step to accept outcomes that hurt the poor. So Radhika, we will start with a fact check of the statement. Yes. I think uh, the statement uh, seems to be hyperbolic. Uh, India was not a deal maker in the sense it claimed. The deal makers were essentially the European Union and the US, where particularly the European Union played a stellar role uh, along with the director general. India merely uh, noted uh, or agreed with whatever was coming from the US and the EU. It did not quite uh, go for the fight to the finish on its major concerns in this meeting. We were told before uh, the start of the meeting that India has some uh, cabinet mandate uh, to fight for what is called the permanent solution for public stockholding food programs. Uh, and also on uh, the termination of the moratorium on electronic transmissions. That is a moratorium not to impose customs duties on electronic transmissions, which has been uh, there since 1998. And uh, surprisingly, the minister did not in any way fight for these two big issues. And on the uh, narrowed down trips, uh, issue, the TRIPS decision. India actually, uh, even before a final decision was reached, it was quite a surprise to see India claiming victory on this, because this is a decision that India, South Africa, and 63 other countries did not quite seek uh, in terms of their original proposal. So in many ways, um, Mr. Goel should have been more circumspect and should have been more careful and cautious because everybody here in Geneva knows what has been India's role. And so shall we I, say that uh, whatever Goel said should be uh, read as the rules? We should say no or not with every sentence. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it was very surprising. In fact, uh, I sort of laughed at, uh, you know, the way these kind of issues are being propagandized, which is not a correct thing to do. One thing is very curious. The entire world was unified to fight against COVID. So there was no question that some correct. corporations should make huge money out of their correct. patient rights and all those things, trade secrets and all those things. But still, one thing is the WTO is discussing it after two years since pandemic yes. stuff. It's unbelievable. And the consensus, my second question is, not at all acceptable for most of the countries. 
seems very unfair. I think both questions are valid. Uh, the very first question about why it took two years to come to a decision on a very, uh, you know, life and death issue. So this was the time in 2020, uh, the proposal by India and South Africa, uh, or in fact, uh, ironically it coincides with Gandhi's birthday, that is 2nd October 2020. Uh, they piloted this proposal. This proposal was a very comprehensive proposal. It sought for the first time the suspension of four provisions of what is called the TRIPS agreement, trade-related intellectual properties. So these four uh, provisions are uh, copyrights, uh, patents, uh, industrial designs, and uh, trade secrets. So they say that by suspending these provisions, countries would be able to produce uh, um, you know, diagnostics, therapeutics, and uh, vaccines on a war scale to combat the COVID-19. It was a very uh, solidly argued proposal and legally uh, consistent in terms of its internal structure. And they gave various examples how IPRs are a barrier uh, to achieve this kind, uh, this kind of ramp up in the production and gave several examples as to how IPRs have impeded progress to address major health crises, emergencies, pandemics and all. So the proposal soon became what one could call as the gravity of the international, uh, uh, you know, uh, international exposure. But a group of countries at that point of time, uh, the US, the European Union, uh, Switzerland, then uh, you have UK, uh, then you have Canada also, uh, which vehemently opposed. So this continued, this opposition continued. Uh, in uh, May, uh, that was May 2021, uh, the United States, under the new administration of uh, Biden gave a signal that we are willing to, uh, for the first time, they moved away from their obstinate positions and said, we are willing to discuss this issue. You said this thing happened on May 2021. By that time, one whole year has been lost and okay. many millions Great. of lives also. Exactly. This is what uh, I cannot comprehend. See, whole world is really under a pandemic running from pillar to post for medicine, for diagnosis, for vaccine. And this mighty organization is discussing and discussing for one year. This is how things happen in WTO always. All uh, invariably they happen uh, like that. But if there are issues of the developed countries, the big boys, uh, they of course uh, sort of, uh, they have a dynamic of their own. Uh, in wherein they prog seem to progress much faster than the issues raised by the developing countries. In fact, uh, that's been a huge problem with this organization. Uh, so also a very uh, significant step uh, that uh, US is willing to negotiate. Suddenly, uh, I think within 10 days or 15 days after her statement, you, uh, India, South Africa, and 63 countries submitted a revised proposal, which is for actual negotiations. Now discussions are over. Now it's let's negotiate on this proposal. But around this time, a new director general came to the WTO. That was in the month of March. And uh, her name is Ngozi. Uh, now, Mrs. Ngozi was earlier uh, uh, working with the World Bank and she was also finance minister of Nigeria. But she actually, uh, according to my analysis, she actually stymied the progress of this. Initially, she said that uh, this is a very difficult issue to be tackled, I mean, in terms of giving this kind of waiver. And, you know, since there are about 250 uh, 
patents involved in a mrna uh, uh, you know uh, mrna vaccine so developing countries should not be going for this kind of uh, you know a bold move and then she uh, along with the support from the big firm she started uh, uh, proposing uh, her third way uh, she called it the third way that third way is involved more collusion with the big farmer than addressing the core issues raised in this waiver so and all this is was, this chief is from nigeria correct uh, but she has a two uh, uh, dual nationality mm-hmm. she is an american and she is also nigeria but uh, she stays in washington and uh, if you uh, read her very first statement that uh, she made when she took over office was somewhat baffling you know no director general comes out with a open agenda that supports the northern countries so um, if the director general should have uh, if she remained quite uh, completely silent or supported the indian south africa proposal which the who uh, director general supported uh, right through uh, that would it would have been a different situation so now it makes sense how this 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 decision towards this very important issue waiver dragged for a very long time got it and what happened in geneva what happened was uh, since the issue was not moving on the trips she constituted what is called a group of four countries called quadrilateral quad that quad comprised of uh, comprised us eu india south africa though so they started their negotiations towards the end of december and those negotiations were held in complete opaque manner nobody knew what exactly was being negotiated uh so in those negotiations what finally emerged was that the eu had submitted a proposal counter uh, as a counter to the developing country proposal that is india south africa and that proposal merely sought some kind of twisting and tweaking uh in the compulsory license provisions without addressing the real issue of you know the the kind of hurdles that are involved in sharing technologies sharing trade secrets or sharing industrial designs which is a kind of technological know how and things like that it merely uh, try to relax the conditions concerning what are called compulsory license provisions so what we have is a na- much narrowed down proposal from these four countries for which india and south africa were finally either uh, coaxed or uh, you know i mean they became party to it and the worst of all indian minister going to the town during the meeting to praise this proposal so to cut the story short can the vaccines be manufactured outside the patent laws can be used in countries where they don't have any manufacturing facilities no yeah. practically what's the outcome so what we have now arrived at is a proposal which is virtually unworkable in the sense uh, vaccine technology is a different cup of tea as compared to making therapeutics or diagnostics uh, incidentally both therapeutics and di- diagnostics are not part of this agreement so these will be uh, have to be negotiated from now within 6 months to arrive at a decision first and foremost vaccine manufacturing is a very complex job and uh, one or two developing countries are eligible uh, i mean are in a stage uh, situation or a state to do this manufacturing such as india for example um, which has been using this voluntary licensing from uh, glass uh, from this uh, uk company uh you so other countries won't be able to do i mean given the kind of uh, flexibilities that are given in this it's very difficult for them 
And also you must uh, recognize the fact that vaccines are now in a uh, overflow. I mean, there are uh, vaccines that have been hoarded and in fact, many uh, large shipments of vaccines are not used. So it's a situation on which uh, the developed countries know that there is no, no harm. I mean, they find, I believe, uh, the European Union issued a kind of three paragraph uh, uh, sort of statement to its members saying that this is a worthless agreement, harmless, and it doesn't in any way change anything. And uh, so that is the conclusion of the European Union, which sent this email to all its members. So you can now imagine that what you have essentially achieved is of a very little value or no value, you know? No value at all, because uh, nobody can actually produce vaccines outside the patent law. Sharing technologies also is going to be a huge problem. These guys are not going to, I mean, the big pharma will only be ready to do what is called voluntary licensing. In the voluntary licensing, what they do is everything is manufactured. There will be a unit in a developing country which will, uh, you know, fill and finish kind. Uh, you fill and finish the, but you don't. You're not sharing the technology or any of those things. It's like a food product, and you are allowed to make the cover for it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's correct. What ideally should have been the decision? The ideally it should have been the suspension of these four IPR provisions, and allow countries to start manufacturing, but that, that would have enabled them to actually genuinely get into the business of manufacturing vaccines. It may not have been a success, but it at least would have broken this kind of stranglehold of the big pharma. You know, for them, the IPRs is a kind of monopoly in the sense that they will never allow any country to relax uh, or to allow flexibilities in IPRs because there are developing countries. You have um, Brazil, you have India, then you have even Bangladesh is making a lot of uh, things, uh, then South Africa, then Argentina. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, these are the countries which can easily do certain things in the world of pharmaceuticals. And I think that is very important because Corona has shown the world that what a pandemic, a virus can do can to the spread. world. And it's not yeah. the first or the last. Correct. Things more, can uh, such, uh, more pandemics can come. Yeah, yeah. Play more right. lives. So you needed uh, international cooperation and solidarity. Uh, not, uh, you know, the big farmers. Uh, you know, can we expect it since no. the debacle in the WTO? Very, uh, not possible. Because, uh, the uh, as I told you, the, the big pharma is so powerful that, uh, for example, it can almost twist the Washington-Biden administration, uh, you know, to get its things done or to stop, stall uh, things. So I don't see such a prospect uh, in the coming years or months, having seen this organization. This organization, I'm convinced, does not work for the developing countries. But many were very much convinced that I have read a lot of articles before the WTO initial conference. And this is a right time when the developing nations exactly. can strike uh, yeah, exactly. a, a better deal. They have yeah. done it before in 1999, in 2013. The developing nations have done that. And yeah. now, when the globalization is actually crumbling down and the Correct. pandemic has taken the world by surprise, Correct. developing nations had a very fair chance to win. But still they win. lost, number one. And number two, India ditched, as you said, yeah. Uh, the uh, India's fellow travelers, the developing nation. Why should India do that? My doubt is that you said that is some way profitable to India alone. It could be the case that India has a robust pharmaceutical industry, particularly for the generic medicines and all. It may be overly confident that even without these particular decision or decisions, it could do things on its own. It's possible. But, uh, you know, having uh, been a solid partner in uh, sort of bringing a qualitative change in the intellectual property right world, it 
final stance of sort of agreeing with this US and EU and praising the agreement was not called for, was, was, has only proved that India cannot be a reliable, trustworthy partner. So that is. So next time, not only in WTO, in, even in any of the international organizations, when India wants to rally other members behind it, it, it will be very, very difficult. As you rightly said, you know, at a time when the globalization has taken a big hit and fragment, fragmentation of uh, global trade has become a reality you, with the emergence of you know, trading blocks and all. India should have actually uh, managed or navigated and the developing countries in a way that things could have been done much differently and for the good of developing countries. It did not quite happen. That is because India did not rally them around. You know, what happens in these negotiations, just to give you a little, uh, you know, uh, kind of background, uh, in these negotiations, they are done in what are called the green room meetings. The green room is a meeting of select countries. And in these select countries, normally the, they are packed with the people uh, like uh, the, the developed countries and their allies. And those who are opposing uh, some of the things that are happening in the organization, they will be very few and in minority. So in a situation like this, if India actually stands up, the other developing countries will rally around because India has the negotiating capital and uh, uh, several other advantages which these countries do not have. And if India then insists that uh, we are not going to buckle down under pressure, we want this kind of an outcome, at the worst, you would have got a compromise outcome flowing from the, the proposal of the developing countries. But for that, India has to fight. What does India exactly want or think of itself? The leader of developing nations or the most trusted ally of the developed countries? Or do they want both at the same time? Correct. correct. I mean, for example, it wants to be seen as in a uh, league with uh, the USDR. There were movements in this ministerial which are very interesting. I don't think the outside world know. Uh, there was one movement when the USDR, when the green room meeting uh, was going, uh, she said, uh, let's stop this meeting. I want uh, to have a word with India. And she takes out, uh, she takes uh, Piyush Goyal out of the room. And then they discuss there and uh, they come inside. Now, God knows what was discussed there on which issues, what issues, what was the kind of understanding reached. We have no idea. And uh, after that, uh, you could see that India is sort of remaining silent time and time again. So these are... There Abandoning was, uh, its old allies, the developing world. Not only world allies, its own positions. For example, the permanent solution on public stockholding programs is so important at a time when you have massive uh, inflationary pressures on food articles. And also you need to protect the interests of your large millions of people, uh, peasants, farmers, uh, who are all uh, now not sure how the PDS system will work whether the government will continue to procure um, these items uh, at that uh, you know, price, uh, the minimum uh, MR, uh, MRP, minimum, no. Minimum support price, MSP. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there are several such things. So ideally what you should have done, and this is also a mandated issue. It's not an issue suddenly flowing into the negotiations. There has been a mandate. That mandate was to arrive at uh, what is called the permanent solution for the public stockholding programs by the last ministerial, which was uh, 11th in Buenos Aires, but their US blocked it. Now you should have got that. And that would have actually helped your peasants as well as address your inflationary issues, which you did not do. So Ravikant, you have been covering the WTO deliberations for 25 years 
and after the geneva ministerial conference what do you think what are the prospects of this wto so what could happen in the coming days i think the developed countries have grabbed what they wanted from this organization they wanted two or three main things like trade facilitation agreement and uh, even the fishery subsidies agreement the rest of the issues the so called new issues there is this big component uh, big agenda item called the wto reforms now it is uh, ludicrous to talk about uh, wto reforms when the one major pillar of the wto called the enforcement thing function that is almost paralyzed because uh, you have what is called the appellate body that has been you know made uh, uh, dysfunctional yes us has united been continuously vetoing new appointments for yes, some time the united states that since 2019 so you are talking of two uh, other functions where the big boys again here the us and eu want to bring massive changes but firstly they want to do away with what is called the consensus principle in wto decisions are uh, ought to be arrived by consensus uh, across all the memberships so you need to actually 164 countries have to agree on anything any one member can raise the flag and block it so the us and eu and all the other developing countries see this as a big problem to advance any new issues and things like that and so they want to do away with the consensus principle so there could be lots of changes the carpet under the feet of developing countries is already pulled and it will be completely pulled by the 13th ministerial if they don't uh, stay uh, you know united with a purpose of solidarity and you know uh, the those are the requirements i mean you know you have to this organization is not very beneficial to developing countries achieving their goals uh, ever since uh, 1995 i mean i can hardly see anything that could be called as a developing country uh, gain in these 25 years there could be one or two here and there but they are not significant enough to be called as a kind of path break uh, path makers or path break okay that's it let's hope that the third world country leaders have an idea of the times in which we live in and to where we are heading to thank you mr ravika it was a pleasure talking to you and thank you viewers for watching us goodbye